When you cut on the tape, ain't no corner, DB, or player in the nation better than me on the field. My last year in high school, I was an absolute ball hawk. If you threw anything in my vicinity, it was getting snatched out the air every time. But somehow, even though I balled out in high school, I graduated unranked. There's no doubt in my mind, I should have been ranked number one. Now, I ain't win no awards or nothing my senior season for how well I played, but I guarantee you match me up with any of these quote-unquote top receivers or tight ends, they getting strapped. There are some players that might have had a statistically better season than me, but they're not better than me. That's just a fact. I know the exact reason why I'm not ranked amongst them boys. But before I get into all of that, based on my play on the field and my extremely impressive academic history, I got an offer from Stanford. These coaches got the nerve to make me the number two corner. I ain't never been number two to nothing or nobody, but don't worry, all that's going to change real soon, trust. Now, kind of getting back into why I wasn't ranked amongst some of the best players in the country and why they just completely disrespected me. Now, like I said, on tape, I was going crazy, but I was balling down in Fairbanks, Alaska, and I know what you're thinking. What was I doing way out there? There's a very simple answer to that. My parents, extremely successful business people, they own about half of the state of Alaska. So yeah, of course, we're rich, always have been, and always forever will be. Like, bro, we got so much money, I never even had to touch a football field or go to college. I really did it because I was bored. I never looked at football like something I wanted to make a career out of. It was really just a hobby. I didn't start playing until my freshman year in high school. And of course, I excelled at it. Better than everybody, day one. And now I'm here in the Pac-12, one of the biggest stages in college football, and I feel like I got something to prove in a way. Like I know for a fact, I got exactly what it takes to be the greatest to ever do it at this level. I can actually make my parents proud. And trust me, that's no easy task. I've only gotten one grade lower than an A my entire life. You'd think my parents would be extremely proud. Wrong. My dad ain't never got a grade lower than an A plus his entire life. And every chance that he gets to remind me, he does. And then he brings up how he went to Harvard, how he did this by 21 and that by 25. It's almost like we're in competition at times. Everything he ever touched, everyone he ever met, everything he's always done in his life, he's been number one. He's been the best. And I don't see myself being anything less than that. So, yeah, I guess you can say we're in somewhat of a competition. But when I'm successful with this career in football, bro, he cannot top this. After the first few games, I finally get a chance to challenge for the number one corner spot. My coach has set me up for failure. 19 of the 20 reps in practice, they ran the ball to the opposite side of the field. And the one time they put the ball in the air, I pick it off, of course. And in their eyes, that's not enough for me to take over the number one corner spot, even though I've been the best corner since day one. So due to my coaches just straight up hating on me, I'm stuck at the number two corner spot. But that ain't going to stop me from balling and making plays. I know football is a team sport, but in order for me to get to the league, I have to ball out as an individual to even get that type of opportunity. Now, of course, as a team, I want us to win and dominate and be the best in the country always. But individually, I got my own goals set. For one, I want to break every single NCAA interception record. I checked the books and some random name, KJ Franks, holds every record. Now, for him to hold every record, he had to be decent, but I know for a fact I'm a way better corner. But it's going to be a little tough to break dude records when my hands are like bricks and not magnets to the ball. But even though I dropped a pick, ain't nobody having a worse day than ASU's kicker. He missed a game-tying field goal with two seconds left on the clock. He's a bum. Another week, another game of me not being the number one corner, and it just doesn't make any sense why. Because I'm going crazy, locking up these receivers, catching picks in the end zone, toe tapping that thing. Come on, who's a better corner than me right now? Whether it's man coverage, zone, it don't matter. I'm running the routes for the receivers, but the only thing I'm struggling with is my brick hands. Don't know how I allow myself to slip up like this, but Leighton Smithson beat me deep for a bomb. Like, what? But that's just one play. I ain't finna get in my head about it, but then he bounced back with a crazy toe tapper for 33 yards. Come on. Like, dude ain't good or nothing. His name is Leighton Smithson. Like, come on now. But he does have somewhat of like a fifth gear. It's crazy. Only a two-point lead under 10 seconds left in the fourth, and they're knocking at our door. Forget that. They just walk right in. And then Washington State adds salt to the wound with their quarterback going untouched somehow into the end zone for the two-point conversion. Bro, that L last week to Washington State did not sit right with me. So I opened this one up against Washington with a deep pick. Overall, I feel like our defense is pretty solid. The safety position is decent. Of course, we strapped that corner, but we do have a little bit of a weakness. The big boys up front, they ain't all that great getting pressure on the quarterback. And in the run game, they're not as dominant as we would like. So don't be surprised if I come out of nowhere from my side of the field or in the backfield or wherever, and I come down and lay the wood from time to time. Take a look at the other side of the field real quick. This receiver ran a disgusting route, but my fellow DB played it perfectly and got a clean pick. 
Now, it wasn't better than any pick I've ever caught, but I can't lie, bro. That was nasty work. Now, I haven't had too much action since the pick earlier in this game, but they finally decided to bomb me late in the fourth. You know I ain't having that. Come on now. Back in practice trying to take over that number one corner spot, they still not putting the ball in the air, so I had to get in there and take it. And this time around, I won't be denied. Your boy is not a number one corner. I'm officially on that left side of the field, and we got number 18 ranked Utah this week. Let's go. I ain't gonna lie, bro. I'm hype. I finally got what I deserve. Anything come my way today, I'm clapping. I'm going crazy. If I'm being real though, my game all around as a corner is damn near perfect, but I do struggle with these routes coming across the middle of the field. But you see what I mean by my guys up front not getting it done? He got completely faced. I had to come in and get the tackle. Like, come on, bruh. And of course, the second I start worrying about what my teammates doing, I slip up. Like, bruh, y'all messing up my game. This ain't on me. And bro, my speed, my speed. I baited this up perfectly, but this QB's throwing the ball so fast, bro. Like with precision too. We got the win. I had a decent game, but I was supposed to have at least two picks on the day, bro. So boom, last week, me and the guys on the team threw a little party to celebrate our win over a ranked team. Nothing too crazy. And like I said, nothing too crazy. About four or 500 people. And we had the whole block shaking to about 4 a.m. But yeah, nothing too wild. And y'all know I'm the hottest freshman in the country. Number one corner. I'm somewhat of the host of the party. In the house we're having the party in, a $3.5 million crib my pops bought for me just so I can be comfortable while I'm on my grind at Stanford. And as time go on, I notice some frat boys walk in. Seniors, five-year guys. I'm like, okay, cool, whatever. But what I didn't know about them boys, they have a terrible reputation of crashing parties and being very disrespectful with the women. Bro, these boys ain't been in the crib for five minutes and they already in here wild and getting disrespectful, drunk. And of course, with it being my party, my crib, I'ma step in and try to defuse the situation. And things just go left, bro. A bunch of cocky, drunk frat guys at a party in front of beautiful girls. It's a recipe for disaster. The football team versus the frat house, bro. It was a full-blown Royal Rumble in the crib. It's kind of funny looking back at it. But of course, campus police showed up. Even the real police showed up. They had to stop everything, break it up. And I was in a lot of trouble, to say the least. And even after everything that transpired, we all was in there going crazy, fighting and whatnot. I was the only one who was in major trouble. So the school slash team ended up suspending me for a game. Like, bro, how you gonna suspend your best player? Now, them boys did pull off the win against number eight ranked Oregon, but bro, how was I the only one to get punished? And man, as you could imagine, Pops was down my throat about this, bro. He was literally on my neck about it. And if I had a dollar for every time he told me he was disappointed within that two-day span, bro, I would be as rich as him. And I'm trying to explain to him it's not that big of a deal. We were just having fun and things may have got a little out of hand. I mean, there was a little fire in the bathroom. The kitchen is torn to shreds and a few of the windows are busted. But we rich. We can afford to fix it. And of course, my mom trying to play peacemaker of the situation. But I love her though. She never hit my throat about every little situation. After I came back from suspension, I let some of the guys in the locker room know how I felt. And I told them straight up how they gonna leave me out to dry. They ain't take no responsibility for what transpired. And out of all people in that locker room, guess who steps up first to get in my face and tell me it's all my fault? The number one, uh, uh, excuse me, the former number one corner whose spot I took as a freshman, of course he gonna be the one to step up, dude salty. And I told him, the only reason you saying that because you not the guy no more. I'm him. You got beat out by a freshman. You trash. And then to my complete surprise, a few of the other guys stepped up on his behalf and they took his side. Like what? And I'm like, how? Explain to me how that was my fault. It was completely out of my control. And then they went on about how I exaggerated. I got disrespectful, blah, 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 blah. And yeah, the situation could have been handled differently. I might have called some dudes out of their names through the first punch, but I had to let them know this is my house. I had to set the tone. And man, ever since that day in the locker room, the team ain't been the same. Chemistry been off. It's just been bad. And I let them boys know straight up, I'm not with the drama. I can go touch a million dollars physically right now if I wanted to. Y'all can't do that. The team needs me. I don't need the team. Now, looking back, I might have said a little too much, might have hurt some feelings, but it's facts and nobody, no one can argue with the facts. Over the next few practices, bro, I'm getting into it with teammates, fights breaking out. And when I'm mad, one thing about it, bro, I'm going to run my mouth and ain't nobody going to like it. And even my DB coach bite into this narrative of I'm the problem. I told that boy straight up, my pops make your salary in a month. Lower your tone when you talking to me. And then during a DB film study session, he gonna say, yeah, BP, you might get demoted back to the number two spot, if not the nickel. Two picks against Notre Dame, demote that. Bro, this one situation has caused so much friction between the team, but I'm locked in, I'm focused, I'm still balling, but I can't say the same for everybody else. 
one period in time we were five and one a five and one record now we're seven and five but at this point throw the whole season away and now we playing six and six pit in this weak ass bowl game bro we should have been competing for a conference championship or something but since we didn't finish this season great as a team i'm looking to personally top it off right as expected, I have the most interceptions of any player in the country right now. I've dropped two this game, but I need one more for 10 picks on the season. Just before the second half, Pitt's quarterback makes a huge mistake lobbing this one up in the end zone, and of course I snag and come down with my 10th interception. But even though I'm balling at an elite level, doing my thing, making plays, my teammates continue to disappoint, bruh. Man, hopefully going into next season, we can bounce back and become the team we were before all of this happened and everybody turned into a bunch of sensitive little girls. Because all this losing ain't cool, especially losing three straight games, one being a bowl game. Like, bro, I'm not with this. Bro, looking at my stats for the season, I had nine dropped interceptions. My sophomore season, I'm aiming for at least 20 interceptions, and I want to be in the conversation for that Heisman. The first game of my sophomore season, and y'all see it, that number one is now on my back. And not only because I'm the number one corner, but because I am the one, the one who's going to show up and show out this season. I'm out to prove something. And after what I would consider a historically great freshman season, I'm looking to have an even bigger one this year. And like I said from day one, my standards for myself and this team are very high. And I've kind of stepped into a leadership role. Important part of being the leader is leading by example. And there's no better example for my defense, but especially my DBs, than catching the pick and taking it back to the crib. Week one, we dominate New Mexico. But I put a cap on this game late in the fourth with another pick. My second of the game, we put them boys up out of there. The level of patience and skill it takes to track a receiver all around the end zone like this is crazy. When you find another corner with this type of IQ, please let me know. I'm that guy, bro. I'm him. If I got to tell you again, I might have to do you how Tank did Garcia, bro. A diving one-handed pick? I'm like that. I might be a young corner myself, but I have a lot of younger high school DBs asking me for tips on how to be a shutdown slash ball hawking DB. But I tell them straight up, everybody can't be elite at the position like I am, but if you got a little bit of dog in you, I can teach you something. But if I had to take everything into account and kind of break it down into somewhat of a Breon Parker science, it'll be something like this. But before I go into detail, take a look at this. 18 seconds left in the fourth, obvious passing situation. I read it like a book, play the route down to a T, and I get the pick. It's real simple. Breaking it down to three core elements I like to call PPT, which stands for positioning, patience, and timing. Now the positioning, where you're lined up pre-snap and when you end up post-snap, depending on where you're in zone, man, or whatever, and what formation the offense is in. Now the patience is very important. You want to give that quarterback and that receiver a look that is too good to be true. And at a moment's notice, as soon as the ball is thrown, then you hop in your opportunity. Now the patience and timing, they go hand in hand. You have to have the patience to let things develop, but you also have to time the routes perfectly so you know when to jump the route and pick that ball off. And it's as simple as that. And if all my young DBs can apply those three things to their game effectively, they can be great one day. Not as great as me, but they can be better than what they are now. One thing I need my youngest to understand as well is that you're not going to be perfect. Even I mess up, and I'm nearly perfect myself. But it's about how you respond to those mistakes that make you. Recently, I've been bumping heads with my DB coach over something he sees to be so important that I just don't. And that's studying film, probably the most overrated thing you can do as a DB, not only as a DB or a corner, but just a player in general. How I see it, if you have to binge watch and study your opponent, maybe you lack something physically or mentally that's keeping you from being as great as somebody like me. For me, when I see something on the field, I can pick up on it, adjust and react to it in real time on the field in that moment. But I get it though, coming across a player that's as gifted with the level of IQ that I possess, the level of skill that I have is it's unheard of. And then he starts telling me about this kid from Ole Miss saying he's a ball hawking corner. He's better than me. He has higher IQ. He's a film junkie. Like what? Some kid named Nick Sabaka. Now, I ain't never heard of him, but people are saying he's supposed to be one of the top picks in the draft, so he might be decent. Oregon State, easily one of my favorite teams to play in college football simply because they have a pass-heavy offense, which means more opportunities through the air. And when there's opportunity, nobody's going to capitalize off of it like I am, and that's a guarantee. While my coach was practically forcing me to watch film, I noticed something. They love to run a bunch of hitches, comebacks, and out routes. I know exactly how to bait those to make the big play. And little did anyone know, it was about to be a very interesting second half from your boy BP. I'm practically living in these boys' playbook. This is easily one of the most instinctive picks I've ever caught in my career. I'm sitting off my zone, reading the quarterback's eyes, reading the field, and before I know it, the ball was in my hands. It came so natural. 
And like I said, they love these short routes. You combine that with a trigger-happy quarterback and you're gonna get pick sixes from the best cornerback in college football. As of lately, one of my teammates who will go unnamed has been kind of off a little bit. Missing practices, late to team meetings, just completely off, throwing off this team as a whole. Now, usually, I don't worry about nobody else but my own greatness. But as a team captain, I guess right now I got to be a little less selfish. So one day, during a team meeting, after he showed up late yet again, I asked him straight up in front of everybody, Bro, what's up? Are you really with us? Because you showing up late or not showing up at all and it's really being a problem. You either with us or you're not. And if you're not, you need to get up out of here. And he ain't say nothing. His face just went blank and he just kind of stood there. Just stared at me with this dark look for about 10 seconds. I take a step closer and I tell him straight up, if you can't stand the heat, little bro, get out the kitchen. We trying to win. And if you get in the way of that, you're going to get clipped straight up. Next thing I know, I wake up and all my teammates just standing over me with a look of shock on their face. Then they help me up off the ground. And then I ask him, what happened? Then they tell me straight up, he hit me so fast, nobody expected it. And after he had already knocked me out, he just went to beating on me. So at this point, I'm mad, but confused at the same time. I know I said what I said, but at the same time, it was the facts. I'm looking for him. I'm trying to figure out where he at because ain't nobody finna embarrass me like that in front of my team. So I'm like, what dorm is he in? Where is he at right now? So later on, I find out what dorm he in. I pull up and I get to banging on his door. I have nothing but bad intentions for this guy. I knock for about five minutes straight and then get no answer. So I end up walking down by the bathroom, hoping I would catch him slipping at some point. So while waiting down by the bathroom, I hear a voice inside that sounds very similar to his. And in the voice I hear in the bathroom, they're on the phone asking somebody to please leave him alone, let him go, saying he'll have their money and some other stuff. And after a few minutes, guess who walks out the stall? My teammate who just so happens to put on his best Mike Tyson impersonation on me. So before I just went to throwing hands, I wanted an explanation. And I asked him, why did you just go crazy like that even though the situation wasn't that deep? And he stands there, stares with a blank stare. So I kind of step back and kind of put myself in a position to be ready for whatever he tried to do. But this time it's not a look of anger, it's sadness. And unexpectedly, he breaks out into a full-blown cry. And the waves of his voice was so loud, it was so much pain, it shook the bathroom. And for the first time in my life, I felt bad for somebody. I didn't know the full details of the situation, but I felt something in my heart that I ain't never felt before. He went back to his dorm room and he explained to me that he grew up in a very tough neighborhood back in Jacksonville, Florida, and his little brother had fallen victim to the streets. And he explained to me one of the friends he grew up with felt like he left them all behind once he came here to Stanford. So they got his little brother in the streets carrying guns, selling drugs, all type of crazy things. And he's been begging his old friends to kind of push his brother away from that life, turn him away from the streets, but they won't do it unless he comes up with some money. And I asked him, how much do they want? And he told me 50K. And bro, I almost laughed. Like, 50K, that's nothing. Like, you should have been paid them. And then he put the situation into a different perspective that I wasn't familiar with because I never had to deal with anything like this due to me being so fortunate. And when he broke it down and explained their childhood, how they would be hungry sometime, he didn't have both parents, they were just less fortunate. And his neighborhood, he described it was like a war zone. And for a minute, I just sat there in silence, trying to comprehend and wrap my mind around what it would actually feel like to live a life like that. And in that very moment, all of the anger and malice I had in my mind and in my heart towards my teammate had evaporated, and I had nothing but the utmost respect for him. The next day, I went to the bank and withdrew that 50K. Met up with my boy, gave it to him, told him to go save his brother's life. Look of peace and appreciation in his eyes, priceless. Being able to help someone that may seem minor to me, but considered astronomical to someone else, it felt amazing. And ever since we resolved that situation, he's been back in practices, all the team meetings, he's bounced back as a whole. With so much going on, including that situation, my focus has kind of been shifted away from football, which is crazy because I've been so locked in. Don't get me wrong, on the field, I'm still balling per usual, still establishing myself to be the best cornerback in college football, but off the field, I've been doing a little bit of soul searching. But for right now, I gotta put that on pause and recenter my focus back on the team because we're close to closing out a very successful season. Last year, this Cal team record-wise was horrible. This year, they're ranked number 19 in the country at 7-3. And, and if I said I wasn't bitter about the L that they handed us last season, I'd be lying. I'm hoping we come out and play some of our best football this season against this team. But one thing I know about this Cal quarterback, he fears me. He knows I'm hot. If he tries to throw anything big my way, he knows and everybody knows it's going to get snatched up. But when teams and quarterbacks try to avoid me, my teammates will see more opportunity. And it's on them to make the big play and execute. So since they want to avoid putting the ball in the air my way and they're trying to run these sneaky quick routes, I'm laying everything out that come my way. It's late in the fourth quarter and we got this game pretty much wrapped up. But when I said my teammates need to capitalize on those opportunities, that's exactly how we end this game. Perfectly. We're ranked number 11, just outside the top 10, but when it comes to our conference and division, we're number one in both. 
So finishing this season flawless is crucial. Even though our national championship hopes are out the window, we still want to finish on top where it matters. But I've been thinking with the huge leap we've taken from last season to this season, I can only imagine what my junior year is going to look like for this team. The defense has gotten better and our offense is way more consistent than last season. We're just going to continue to build on that momentum. To my surprise, even with a 9-1 record, Army hung with us throughout this entire game, making it a shootout. But in the end, offense kept putting up points, and even though we didn't play as well as we should have, the defense got the stops that mattered to win the game. My pops called me the other day, which is kind of unusual. I mean, we talk, but not as frequently and as consistently as you think that a father and son would. But not for obvious reasons. He's usually traveling at a thousand miles per hour trying to make different business plans, handling business, being a boss, just doing this thing. And on my end, I'm always busy as well, maintaining my 4.0 GPA, locked in with my craft on the field to maintain my dominance. So when we're both not busy and actually have time to talk, we always have a lot to catch up on. And to my surprise, he started this phone call off with something I thought I'd never in my life hear him say to me. And it was an awkward silence for about 30 seconds. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I was confused, actually. Then I finally asked him, what made you say that? That was just so random. And honestly, Pops, I never thought I'd hear you say that to me. He told me, son, you really think you can move $50,000 of my money without me noticing? Even though it's your account, I have access to it all. And then I thought, yeah, that makes sense. But then again, I'm still confused on what I did exactly to make him proud. Come to find out, after I withdrew the 50K, he had a PI follow me to make sure I wasn't in any trouble that I couldn't handle. Don't ask me how, he knew exactly what I needed the money for. He found out where and who the money went to, he got it back, and he gave it to my teammate's mom made sense when my pops was proud. I had finally grew out of my cocky, arrogant, selfish ways and did something for someone else. I finally grew into a man. One word to describe my sophomore season here at Stanford, historical. But by this time next year, the only word I want to describe my junior year, champions. My junior season, my last season here at Stanford, and we couldn't get off to a worse start getting mossed by this big body receiver. When it comes to playing corner, man, zone, whatever, I'm elite. But when it comes to my tackling, I've gotten a lot better with that. You're going to see me laying the boom a lot this season. But tackling really isn't in my nature, so from time to time, I might get embarrassed going for the big hit. But before I even consider going into the draft, I need to get some good film out there. I mean, I got a bunch of picks, but I need to show some instincts on film. And this is a great example of that, having a deep zone, but being able to sniff out the run, avoid or shed the block, and get down to make the big play. You take my developing skills to pick up the run, mix that with my coverage ability, you have a unicorn of a cornerback. The goal for this season is to win a national championship, point blank period. It's going to take both sides of the ball to play in an elite level to reach that goal. And look at this elite coverage. Quarterback thought he had a bomb. I caught this one perfectly in stride, turned it up field, swerving my way through traffic for the huge pick. And plays like that are what define my ability as a corner. If I don't judge that ball perfectly, I don't catch that. Starting out this season ranked within the top 10 is easily one of the best things that could have happened to us as a team. The grind to become the number one or even a top five team won't be easy, but you got to think, we weren't ranked last season. My freshman and sophomore season, I was more of a solo act, so being able to trust my teammates to make the big plays when the opportunity presents itself is priceless. We jumped four spots since our game last week against Oregon State, and this week we got number 13 ranked Oregon. It's third and seven. I'm trying my best to bait Bo Nixon to throw in this route in the flats, but he put this ball in a bucket to this receiver for a touchdown. We're down three points late in the third going into the fourth, and this is where we need to make the big stops, and we do exactly that here on third and two. Offense needs a spark, so I get involved in the return game. After setting up some blocks, swerving my way through traffic, I set them up with some great field positioning. I came through with the huge return to set offense up, and they punched it in, but now I come up with the most clutch play of the game with a crazy sideline pick to cap this one off. No matter what their record is, every single season, UCLA gives us a problem, but we're trying to change the tide this season. I usually don't play or even recognize when they're running the screen, but that last play, I read it like a book, and then I had the nerve to drop the easy pick six. This quarterback has been trying me out the gate, and I love it. I know for a fact I'm going to get a few opportunities to pick the ball off. We got a 13-point lead right before going into the second half, but on this play, they put the convoy in front of this running back, and I tracked them all the way across the field just for him to walk in the end zone anyway. At this point, I don't even think this quarterback cares about the big play. He just loves the fact that he can get away with these quick, short routes in my zone. One thing about this team, if they start to get some momentum rolling, it's no stopping them. So we have to put it into it right now or this game could get out of hand. I told you, at some point, I'm going to teach this quarterback about throwing it my way and trying me. And that's exactly what I do on third and 15, taking a long stride to pick this ball off, man. Come on. After the pick, offense went down and capitalized on their opportunity. But I want to send these boys home with their head down. Another pick to cap this one off. I'm really like that. 
we gonna open this one up against one and three Colorado with a huge hit on this quarterback for a negative two yard rush. We starting off hot today. Man, the patience, the positioning, the timing on me jumping this route when I had a deep zone was perfect, but my hands are bricks. Nothing irks me more than dropping an easy pick, especially when they could have went for a pick six. That's like my second drop potential pick six in like the last two or three games. Want to know who ain't dropping no picks? Them boys on the other side of the field. He leaped up in the air on the deep ball, came down and toe tapped it. Oh my goodness. Remember I said I wanted to make a lot more plays, tackling and doing things like that. Well, it's been somewhat of an up and down experience for me. But of course, to no one's surprise, Colorado couldn't hang with the number three team in the nation. We're super close to making our way to that number one spot. Now, I'm usually the one to get the party started with the picks, but one of my fellow DBs and teammates decided to kick this one off by almost taking it back to the crib. Now, my big boys up front, they don't consistently get in the backfield making plays on the running back and the quarterback, but when they do, it is very exciting. Now, I'm not one to give kudos and props to receivers I locked down, but I got back on this play, put my hand on that ball, and he still made the tough catch. Going back to what I said about our defensive front, that's probably our only weakness, so me stepping down trying to make more tackles would definitely help keep us from getting ran all over. When I'm not playing down trying to make plays in the run game, best believe I'm like a hawk in the air snatching that ball, bro. Somebody please tell my teammates, get out my way after I get the pick. I'm trying to go back to the crib. I can honestly say that this was a perfectly thrown ball, but even better coverage. The way I get back in stride and just uh, snatch that, come on now. First half of the season, we started off perfect, but this back half, this is where it really matters and where the true test begins. And so far, my defense, straight dominance. I don't even think we've given up three touchdowns in a single game yet. To make up them two potential drop pick sixes I had over the last couple of weeks, I get one here on second and 13. I gave Drake May the look he thought he had to put this one into the crib. A quick tip to all my DBs out there, there's no reason to get back into a full sprint when you have help over the top. Stand your back, pedal, bait up the route, get a QB that look, and go get that pick. Now this is unacceptable. Offense haven't put up a point the entire first half. I know North Carolina is a pretty good team, but we gotta find a way to score on teams like this some way, somehow. But if they ain't gonna do it, I'ma do it. I grabbed my third pick, my second pick six, put up our only 14 points we've had throughout the first three quarters. Well, I guess my boys on the offensive end needed a lot, and I do mean a lot of motivation to go down and score because they finally went and did it midway through the fourth quarter. During spring and summer practice, I did what all players do. Worked on my game, worked on my technique, got better, gelled with my teammates, you know, the usual. But if you remember back to last season where I went through somewhat of an identity crisis and I was trying to find myself, I did a lot of that too. I had to do some self-reflection, my cocky, arrogant attitude, the way I moved throughout life, the way I looked at people and viewed everything. I had to completely change my perspective. And hold on, can we take a second to just appreciate the speed at which I got back to the sideline to get this pick? Amazing. But the way I viewed things was completely screwed up, and I didn't notice it until I got an inside look into someone else's life and their problems. So in order for me to continue to grow as a man and a person in general, I've been doing a lot of things like getting involved with the community to help those who are in need. And to be honest, I never thought it would feel this good to be such a helping hand to so many people. It's really amazing. And what I say, that schedule finna start getting real. Number six ranked six and one Washington. We at the crib though, but we are in the rain. Third and five and they're just about to start knocking on the door to end zone, but I ain't letting it happen. I sit on this route, get back to the spot before the receiver and I pick up the interception. I hate having to do this. Track a running back, receiver, or any player all the way across the field to try to make the play myself when my teammate six just ran right past him. It's been somewhat of a trend this season for quarterbacks to only throw the ball my way when I'm not baiting up the receiver, if I'm all over him, if it's a super short route. I'm starting to see the light from my team. I got exactly what I wanted out of my guys today. We stepped up and played big on both sides of the ball against a very good Washington team. See, when I looked at the schedule, I envisioned USC being ranked, probably undefeated around this time, but five and four, that's outrageous. But we ain't gonna sleep. It's games like this where you're playing what seems to be a lesser opponent where you have to step up and dominate. Because the moment you sleep like I did here on first and goal, they can either punch it into the end zone or just overall make a big play to change the game. You probably noticed, but we're now the number one ranked team in the country. And if we finish this season now undefeated, bro, that's like a guarantee to the national championship. But if UFC would have had success on this last second Hail Mary, the national championship being number one ranked in the country, all of that would have been out the window. Fall off of this Cal team needs to be documented. This time last year, they were ranked within the top 15. Now they're two and eight. 
But one thing about it, bro, they always have a decent, if not great, running back. I wouldn't be surprised if he break off a few good ones on us today. The entire game against USC, I didn't get targeted. But when I finally get an opportunity against Cal, my teammate cashed in before I could. But going through three quarters and barely putting up 10, 15 points, I'm tired of it. We cannot win a national championship playing like this. It's do or die. One minute left in the fourth, third and goal. I come down, get the tackle. I rip the ball away just as we're coming down, but they do recover. And as soon as I was about to set my mind on us going into overtime, this receiver drops the easiest pass of his life, giving us the win. How is Notre Dame ranked at number 19, sitting at 7-4? I have no idea, but this is the final game of the regular season. It's been two games since my last pick, and I'm starving for one. And I finally get another opportunity, but I misjudge the ball, and this receiver runs right past me. And crazy enough, right before the second half, one of our savvy seniors takes a page out of my book, plants that foot, get back to the sideline for a great pick. Bruh, it's been so long since I got a pick, even my technique is a little off. I let this receiver beat me inside with this slow, ugly cut. Somehow we drop back to become the number two team in the nation, and I think that's partially due to the fact that we don't put up many points against teams we should blow out. One play stands in between us and a perfect regular season. He throws it right in the coverage. My teammate on his way down catches the pick and secures the dub. After a nail-biter against the number 19 ranked team in the nation, we drop from number two in the nation to number four. Like, bro, the math ain't math, and we were number one, then dropped to number two, and then skipped three and went straight back to four. How are we de-ranking even though we're winning? Now, I want to say it's too early to panic, but we're in the Pac-12 championship game, so in the next couple of weeks, the national championship game will be played. But even though we're not putting up a bunch of points against these teams, we're not allowing a bunch of points. We haven't given up more than 21 or 23 points the entire season. So I don't even think we've given up two touchdowns in the past three or four games, but somehow we continue to fall, and bro, it's, it's just not right. But after securing the Pac-12 championship and advancing to 13-0, there's no way we don't squeeze into that one or two spot. So even after the win, we finished ranked number three in the country, and Oklahoma and Ohio will match up in the national championship game. I don't know how this happened. If somebody told me at the beginning of this season that Ohio, not Ohio State, but Ohio would be in a national championship over us, I would call them crazy. Don't get me wrong, an undefeated season is something to be very proud of, but I really thought my last year here at Stanford, we would be competing in the biggest game in college football. But I think it has to do with what I said earlier this season. We weren't putting up any points against teams we should have blew out, and I think that really hurt us in the polls. But after not getting an interception for four straight games, I finally break my dry streak with a pick here on the sideline against Indiana. But I ain't done turning up. On this play, I redirect my focus multiple times, get back in perfect position for the pick. I even had a decent return on it. And to put the cherry on top of an already amazing performance for myself, I high point this ball to the fullest, come down, toe tapping, and send them boys home. A perfect 14-0 with no national championship while playing in the Pac-12, that's unheard of. And hands down, the most shocking thing about this entire season, Ohio finishes undefeated as well, and they win the national championship against OU. I can honestly say my college career was successful. I'm a proven winner and game changer, so whatever NFL team takes a chance on me, they're getting the best player in the